Well, your autobiography is Oxford Boy, but actually you went to Cambridge. I did. So what did you read there? I read history at Emmanuel College. I had a scholarship, which for two years anyway, until I got a 2-2 in part one. Then they decided they wouldn't renew it, which, is, which, was, which was the form. Did oh. better in part two, though. So having left Cambridge, you then went into journalism. and You went, you went and worked at, in Sheffield, is that right? I did. I wanted to be a journalist. I tried to get onto the, the main scheme, which was the Times and all that. Didn't get onto that. There was another one uh, which had a lot of uh, newspapers all around the country, Westminster Press. But then I applied to United Newspapers, who just started a journalist scheme. And they were, they were based in Sheffield, and they owned the Sheffield Star, Sheffield Telegraph, and the Lancashire Evening Post in Preston. And I got onto that. They'd just invented a trainee scheme, and they had a three-month trainee ship, which we mostly failed. There were eight of us. Uh, we mostly failed to uh, learn shorthand, but we right. it was absolutely fascinating because you went down a, I went down a pit, you know, I went to drop forges, I went to the steel mills, you know, it's all part of getting to know Sheffield, and uh, yeah. I actually liked Sheffield a lot. Um, but after six months, uh, which came up pretty well at Christmas in whatever year, or 64, I suppose, you you then, if they wanted you to stay on, and they did, they, you had to sign indentures. So you'd stay there for two years in those days. And just at that moment, I had a falling out with a girl, so at least put that, she fell out with me. And in the sort of idiot way you do when you're 21, you think, oh, bugger, I'm not staying here. I'm going, you know, I've got to do something else. And the editor of the paper, a guy called Mike Finley, who I did know thereafter, rang me up and said, Will, you know, I think you make a good journalist, come back. And my pride wouldn't let me go. I should have done, really, but my, it was absolutely, I didn't want to sort of go slinking back my tail between my legs. So what did you do? Well, I came down to London, I hadn't got a job. I applied for various jobs. I was offered a job as the librarian at the Institute of Estate Management. Didn't think it was going to be me. Uh, I did some supply teaching at a school in King's Cross, which was pretty interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a rough, r- rough area. In those pretty days. rough area. It was a secondary school. And one of my main memories is having to do playground duty at lunchtime. And some work was going on on the building. And I walked around a corner and there was some scaffolding up with a rope and a pulley. And on one end of the rope were about six big lads. And on the other end of the rope was round the stomach of a small boy who was at this point 30 feet or more above the ground because they pulled him up there. And one's first thought was to shout, stop. But if you say stop, they'd all <laughs> let go and he'd have splattered. So I had to walk slowly towards them as they lowered him to the ground. Then they all scattered and I couldn't get hold of them. You know, I did that for a bit. It, you know, obviously I was filling in. I knew I wasn't a teacher. And then I got a job as a trainee with the Greater London Council. I had visions of myself in a hard hat saying, pull those houses down there, houses for the people over here, a new road here. What a, anyhow, there was absolutely nothing. They had a trading scheme with absolutely nothing to do. You just sat in an office with a lot of other people who were working. And mm. that was a very soul destroying. And then I saw an advertisement so, or someone told me about the the BBC jobs as studio managers in sound, when a lot of graduates went in in those days. Um, and friends of mine had, or one or two, and I knew about it anyway. So I applied for that. First interview went very well. But in the second interview, I'd done no preparation whatsoever. Mm. I just thought my general wonderfulness would carry me through. But um, they started asking me about what went on in a tape recorder and so on, which was... I never used a tape recorder in my life, you know. And it became clear I knew Benny knew it was inside a three-point plug. And so I got a very nice letter from Dennis Moriarty, who was the appointments officer doing it, saying, I'm, I'm dear Mr. Wire, I'm afraid you've not been selected. You know, you fell down. I'm not sure they said why, but it was pretty obvious why mm. I wasn't going to get in, and I knew. Uh, but he said, we're also looking for journalists at the moment, and I'm enclosing an application form if you'd like to apply, um, as you have some journalistic experience. Yep. Well, I had next, next to no journalistic experience, really. And there was no trainee scheme for news. But they obviously had a system of t- in the newsroom and radio of taking in one horny-handed pro, a guy called Mike Ratcliffe, who got in from the High Wycombe newspaper, and some young idiot, really. And, and I got... I had to do tests and we had to do some pracy and cut down stuff and answer a lot of questions about 
um, current affairs, international affairs, and which I was able to do in those days. And I got selected. So, and it was, I was paid exactly twice as much as being a studio manager in sound. £1,570 a year. NUJ rates, you see, yes. B1, whatever the grade was in those days. And I couldn't think how I'd spend all the money. So you became a journalist in news, mm. presumably... The, the, the main newsroom and broadcasting, broadcasting house. house. Yeah. yeah. What was it like, I mean, when you started? Well, it was a self-contained little world. A, I think Radio News was anyhow, and certainly the newsroom. You know, people, I kind of looking back, people weren't in a newsroom by accident. They didn't want to go out into the world, if you know what I mean. And every now and then, sort of a glamorous figure would arrive in a shiny suit, and it would be Bob Elphick, who was a foreign correspondent or someone like that. And they clearly came from a different planet for all, from all of us in the, in the newsroom. There were some good people there. And it was, for a start, you didn't type your own stories. You dictated them to a typist who typed them up the theory being that you would then hear any infelicities of language which would come out over the air because you'd, you'd hear it all out loud very clearly first. I mean, it meant you, you did your two stories in a morning or whatever it was and didn't take your morning's work. And then you'd do in the afternoon. Or, and then you did a lot of overnight shifts too. But um, I, it was pretty luxurious when you think about it. And I remember there were... There were some people who did only overnight shifts. I remember in particular one typist. She was. She seemed to me a woman of enormous age. Uh, she had a, a sort of parchment-like skin, grey at night, bag. And one night at about two in the morning, I was dictating a story to her, and there were, every, there were about two of us in the room, you know. And, there were, and she suddenly turned to me and said, "I know more ways of sexual intercourse than anybody else in the BBC." <laughs> You know, and I was a kind of innocent young startling. fellow, yes. <laughs> but uh, so it was a it was a very condensed. There was a rather glamorous guy called Palmer Ritzema, what a great name, known as Ritz, who had been a dance man singer, who was the editor in yeah. one of the duty, duty editors. So and, and it was you know I I liked it because you you were the, although it was wasn't that testing in many ways, you were at the centre of affairs and it was all going on and you and you. Uh, you, you had one of the jobs you had was a copy taster because all the the um, a correspondence sending stuff, but that would always go to the, the editor would always use all think about using those. But you had um, United Press, Associated Press, uh, uh, the French news agency translated. You had AP, you know, the, and and you had Reuters. So there were about five or six streams of tape, and it came in off tape, you know, tape machines. In those days, all typed out of them, out of a machine, mm -hmm. well, or, or imprinted in the yeah. machine. And the copy taster's job was to read all these pages of bloody stuff and decide what should go to the editor of the day for consideration and what should be chucked away. And you know, the masses of it. Um, and one lived in fear of the, because the, the archetypical story was all the. the Probably a, was it apocryphal? I don't think it was. The the man who spiked the nationalisation of the Suez Canal. You know, which led to war. Sounds like a Bateman cartoon. <laughs> well, yeah, it was rather. And what had happened was, it was just sort of on page five, a long speech by Colonel Nasser, and he was all about all this bloody stuff and chucked it away. And then it was only later that it turned out it was kind of cause for war. You were desk bound in yep. a sense. So yep. the correspondents were like a, a different class or different. Well, they were in separate class. room. They, they only came in very occasionally if they, you know, to meet and greet or probably to talk to an editor they knew or something like that. The reporters were in a separate room. Mm -hmm. Overseas correspondents, obviously a separate lot as well. Correspondents would send in their, their reports from overseas and you'd listen to them quite often. You have to listen to them, make some notes and say what it's about and, you know, should we use it or not. There were some very nice people there and one or two bloody irritating people. As their own life. There was one guy, there was a Yorkshireman who was one of the editors of the day. And... He just wouldn't trust you with anything. He'd give you a piece of tape, you know, that was from AP or Reuters or something like that, or a couple of pages, and he'd have gone through it with a pencil, adding the odd word, crossing out other words, and editing it, really, and then say, I think it's how this is it, Will. And if you changed it at all, when it went back, he said, no, I think it's probably better like this. And you, so essentially, he just kind of gave you something to read out to a typist and then give back to him. So did you get anywhere near a mic? Once or twice, 
I had to do a report. The night they brought in breathalysers, I think it was. It was it sort of came on stream at midnight or something like that. Or to, and so I did a ring around and then did a sort of one minute piece without leaving the room to do it as one could. Yeah. But essentially, once or twice, on one or two other occasions, and going on attachment, I went to attachment in Bristol and did things there and so on. But essentially not. Essentially, you were in the newsroom and I knew I had to leave. But in those days, there was no rolling news. It was all bulletins for yep. the nine o'clock or whatever it was, the six o'clock, the nine o'clock. How up to date were were you? Or were you constantly checking things to see if they were accurate? Or could you actually put news in front of a uh, an editor at very much the last minute? Well, it was pretty up to date. The, the, the rule was you, you, the, you would never go on only one source, unless it was a BBC correspondent, yep. then you would go with him or her. And I think you could go with Reuters. By and large, they wanted two sources. And that was the editor would decide, you know, the editor of the day and would decide all that. We had to take the bulletin down to the newsreader. And that was, you know, you pass the sheets to them and so on. And then you'd always be two or three short stories at the end to see if, and you'd have timed them all beforehand. So if you've got 20 seconds left, you'd give them a 15 second story. And if you had 30 minutes seconds left, you'd give them a 25 second story. So a bit of arbitrariness about what got in or not, as there is with news. And one of the things that newsreaders like to do, they used to, especially when you were new, they try and make you laugh while they were reading the news out. And one of the ways they would do it was to press press the mute button and say, I'll just adjust my balls for better residence. And the Prime Minister went on. <laughs> you know, so so you, were, you were left there trying to uh, hold it in. That's very funny. So who were the uh, who were the the, the main newsreaders there? Was it, was it Brian Perkins and Co? Brian Perkins. You had a separate news desk for Radio 3. As for all the, as from Radio Four, as as from Radio One, was it still the light? Program? Whatever it was, mm. it? Brian Perkins was certainly one. Well. I'm just trying to remember. The, Peter Barker, I think, was you know wonderful voice. He was doing it. And would they want to alter your English at all? Presumably, they cared very much about English style. Oh yes. Or was that really mediated by the editors? They read what they put in front of them. And they, they didn't, right. that, that was, they didn't have a choice in that. That's what they had to do. But interestingly, um, there would be the pronunciation unit, which still exists, I, I understand, used to put up a list of words. There'd be a little, in the newsroom, there'd be a list of words that you might pronounce wrongly, or, and you should understand them. Economics, not economics. Finance, not finance. Contribute, not contribute, and so on. Like that, that, these would be handed down from the, from the, the pronunciation unit, much more fluid these days, of course. Now, in those days, I suppose you were just coming to the tail end of the, the period when radio was the premier service, was the, the yes. most important thing that the BBC did. And television, presumably, was the upstart, and it was beginning to, as it were, cross over in importance, was it? Well, to me, television was the exciting bit. To the people in the newsroom, particularly the older people, it was a jumped up, couldn't trust them. What do they know about news? You know, oh, you heard their running order. <laughs> you know, you know, like that. Um, it was it was thought to be Johnny come lately very much so, even though it was a pretty primitive outfit from right, the first TV news. I think it had changed by then, but you know, it was barely with pictures and and very formal. You know, old news hands. You would understand. That's what they would. You know, they'd been used to that was their world. Sure, and they were at Ali Pali, weren't they? They were at Ali Pali, and, and so they were. There was, I think, it came together at the top with the director of news and current affairs, but not in any day-to-day -day meaningful sense to us worker bees. But Television Centre had been built. I forget when Television Centre was, was about opened. 1960, I think, and it opened about 62, I think, right, something so, like that. So it's been 60. going for four or five years mm. um, at this stage, and Lime Grove, of course, was still. Presumably, the the the, uh, the centre for current affairs was Lime, television. Current affairs in Lime Grove. Lime Grove, yeah. Okay, you had an interest in television, but how did you then get into it? Well, I tried to get an attachment to current affairs and failed. Not least, the guy who interviewed me, the main guy, was a guy called Stanley Highland, who was a quite a senior news guy. And I didn't know, but he had been the producer of all Harold Wilson's broadcasts on air. And in the course of the interview, I for some reason. God knows how I launched into a huge tirade about how terrible they were and how they could all be better. It was only after I said, you know, you did them, didn't you? Well, I didn't. That may not have been the only reason they didn't give me a job, but they didn't. 
But I then got an attachment to a sort of a Cinderella department, you might call it presentation. Oh. Because presentation was a department in television which had, they, they had two studios because when Television Center was built, there were InVision announcers. And you have two, so you could have one in BBC One and then one in BBC Two. They could be seen on screen. By the time they opened Television Center, they had no, they got rid of the Vision announcer. So they, these studios were, one was used for the weather, and the other little programs started to be made there by the department, which was responsible for getting the programs on the air, writing the links, doing the trailers, all that sort of keeping the schedule to time, and all that sort of thing. So it was a, a crucial sort of at the the crux of the organization you might say and important in that way and he had just started making some programs because these studios were empty they did late night lineup on bbc2 why because it was a studio was sitting there empty and the guy was running at the time said look we could do something in this and they did and on bbc1 they would they did some short programs as well and that's clearly what it, what attracted me and i got onto it and when i went there um you had to do a session you had to work in the network as it were for a bit the first night i was on my own i put a wrong program out it, 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 it wasn't <laughs> all my fault but it was certainly in part my fault what would happen was uh, you'd you'd, you'd re review the intro of the next program or the next program but one while a program stuff was on air you know make sure that if it was on tape as a you know, big two inch tape mm. um if it was down in vt and they had it and you'd you'd, you'd say okay vt you know run run the opening and you'd, you'd watch you see the opening of the program uh, and check it through and check your timings and all that so you know how it began and you had paperwork that went with it to tell you how it began and so on and you can anyhow the program came on and after about five minutes the agonized telephone call ran in the in the gallery hello what is it it's whatever it is the who was the producer from bristol you've got the wrong take and sure enough, he said it's going to end in about three minutes, you know. Um, and what had happened was they'd sent the wrong tape up to London with the right paperwork. Now, I should have, a savvier person might have spotted there was a slight difference between the paperwork and the beginning of the programme, but that's what it was. Anyhow, I thought, oh, I guess this is, my, this is the end, you know. This is, I'm, I'm in so trouble. it was still running. And it, well, we had to take it off the air and put something else oh, on. Did you? Oh, to take it off the air okay. because it was going to... It was going to just stop, you know, someone shouting, that's that, that, whatever. And the next, I went into work the following day thinking, I'm almost certain to get the sack, I'll certainly be sent back to tap radio. Anyhow, no one ever said a word <laughs> from that day to this. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time you've admitted this, presumably. No, I, I have I have admitted before, but you know, looking back, you think, well, why wasn't it a bloody great inquest, you know? So you had points of view, you had um, late night lineup. Who was presenting Late Night Lineup at that time? Well, I worked on Points of View first with a guy called Ian Johnston, who was they'd, he was producing Points of View, which is a five-minute once-a-week programme, and they wanted to do Junior Points of View so he, and one or two other little things. So as a trainee or attaché, I was put to work with him, and we got on like a house on fire and loved it and did a lot of other stuff over the years. And that was from Pres A, Pres B Studio, which was, the, was where was for BBC Two, and that's where Late, late Night Lineup was done every night. Joan Bakewell, Sometimes. Joan was there, Mike Dean was there, Tony Bilbo, Sheridan Morley. All right, yes. The first two or three years I was there, I worked only on BBC One mm. with Ian Johnston, and we did a series called The 50s, about the 1950s with Robert Robinson, um, and we did oh, several other series. Then I started some series, but we, we, um, then I was put on to Late Night Lineup after a couple of three years. And help bring it to an end. <laughs> that sounds as if you brought out the night. Well, no. The thing about Late Night Liner was, it was the last thing on at night on BBC Two. It was, in quotes, open-ended, fatal. So it often went on too long. And by and large, it was rather, well, I won't say lefty, but it was just sort of right on, you know. And the, the, a lot of episodes, a lot of items went on a long time. My instinct was quite the opposite. It was to keep, you know, I pack in five items in a show that other people would only have one or possibly two. It must be more expensive. And and the editor, I don't think he much liked it, but he never told me not to do it. But then, I, and then after I've been there about 18 months, the, cha the channel controller, Robin Scott, wanted to completely change his schedule and he wanted to get rid of Late Night Lineup, which we did. But instead, 
out of that came, I did a show called The Book Program. We started, I started a weekly show about books. We, then we started one about the press called Edition, I started. Um, there was a film program, Film Night, and then a pop program, Color Me Pop, I think it was called first, and then it became Old Grey Whistle Test, ah. was the music one. You know, so we had a sort of night um, for, a different, for a different kind of show. And you could do quite a lot in that really remarkably small studio. Well, and you look back, I mean, if you ever you ever watch the archive from Ogre Whistle Whistletist, yes. it's pretty well priceless. I mean, it's always being used because you've got, you have the Who there. Don't they have Bob Dylan, but they certainly had, you know, John Baez and, and uh, Dave Bowie. And all these people almost making their first TV appearances. A lot of them were in uh, the Ogre Whistle Whistletist, run by Mike Appleton, who did a wonderful job. I mean, the, God, the BBC should have been thankful to Mike because... It was his vision, really. He had this idea of how the show should be. And um, and the rule was you didn't get on unless you produced an album. So it wasn't just for the one-hit wonders, you know. It had A record company had to have invested enough in you to have produced an album of dozen numbers or something. And then he brought in a lot of American people who would never be seen over here. You know, he, he did a great job. Were you directing or, just, or were you producing? I, I had one or two ham-fisted goes at directing. I, I look back in horror... And I, I, some, who was it? somebody won an Oscar and we did a special interview on BBC One. I was Kirk Douglas or something. Mm. And I was directing. I'd never directed anything in my life before. You know, and the shots were all over the bloody place. You know, the, the star was in the far distance. Then there was a close up of the interviewer. When I looked back, I dread to think. Um, anyway, <laughs> I, essentially, I wasn't a studio director. Looking back, it was shambolic amateur night. You know, a lot of it. You know, you just, people just did stuff. Quality control was pretty low, you know. Like I so I directed something on BBC One at half past nine at night for a half or to maybe in ten o'clock for half an hour, and I never directed anything before. Mm. And being a cocky blighter, didn't bother to ask anybody how to do it, <laughs> which I mean is terrible when I yeah. think about it. Late night lineup got a reputation for being very alcoholic. No, it wasn't particularly alcoholic. I uh, think in the gallery we mean rather than. Uh, well, there was a one famous director, a very good director called Tom Corcoran, who was often, as he put it, refreshed. Ah. Uh, but he was a jolly good director, in fact, a very good director. Mm. I did some very good outside broadcasts of pop groups at the, the Shepherd's Bush uh, Empire and uh, elsewhere. Um, and I did once have to tell him off for being pissed. I, I did. No, he, he, he had a great, a very, when you look back, rather appealing trick. You're going live on air. At about a minute to go, he'd disappear. He'd go to the gents. And he'd arrive back as you got down to about nine of the countdown, you know, and sit there. And then he would do it. He could do, and he, he enjoyed, as it were, playing with us all in this way, I guess. But one night he was rather pissed. And I did wait the following morning and I, I said, Tom, look, if I ever see you like that in the gallery again, I'll make sure you never direct anything I have anything to do with. And that could be curtains for you, you know. But he was fine. He was a really, he actually was a very nice guy. But, but otherwise, there were plenty of skivers there, loose thinkers. Some one or two very, very good people, of course, mm -hmm. but it wasn't particularly boozy in that way. A bit but, shaggy, I think, probably. Yeah. It did a lot of good things. It, you know, it interviewed a lot of playwrights and and performers and writers and all kinds of other stuff. It, it, in that way, and it was open. And it, it's a central reason it started as a program that went called at seven o'clock on BBC Two, and BBC Two was going to open at seven thirty late night lineup it was the line it was a show about what was going to be on that evening that's how it began and then it moved to the end of the evening i think rowan Ayers, the editor managed to contrive that and that allowed it to have it's 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 then we did a lot of sort of discussions about programs that had been on that night it was a very useful safety valve for the bbc because you had some matters of taste or difficult subject you could then have a discussion afterwards and thrash it out and put all the cases and so on and it and it and it's it widened its remit hugely. Yes, that's interesting. So it started as a preview program yep. for the for the channel, yep. and then ended up as an arts yep. an arts program, effectively. Essentially, it was an arts program. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was an arts program, as it were, from the pages of the Guardian. I think you'd have to say now. No, you could say it then, but or the Guardian wasn't the Guardian then in the same and way. Wasn't it a late night lineup where Ken Tynan said "fuck" for the first time? No, that was. That was on the Saturday night BBC One show that followed. That was the week. And I know because my old friend Robert Robinson was 
in the chair at the time. And he said, I, it was live, you know. And he said, I could see it coming. I knew he was going to say it, but there was nothing I could do except then ignore it and, and carry on. Yeah. Not so much a programme, more a way of life, I think it was called. Oh, yes, indeed. So you some very good presenters. Well, you had Joan, who was very good, of course, top talent. Yes. Mike Dean was very good. He, he had a slightly sort of sort of shrouded manner. He could do a 45-minute interview in his, from his head. He, didn't, he never carried and never used notes in the studio, Mike. He was from New Zealand, wasn't he? He was. Yeah. And who started the film programme? Was it Barry Norman right from the word go? Um, that, on, that was on BBC One. There were two pre programmes. There were on BBC Two, that had grown out of Late Night Lineup. There was um, Film Night, Phil, Philip Jenkins, sort of remember. Oh, yes. And then, God, who else did it? And on BBC One, Ian Johnson started what was Film 71. That was it. That's when it began. A half hour thing about films, and that was. And he tried out several people before settling on Barry Norman. You know, I know I was never the greatest director or anything. On the other hand, I was quite good at coming up with ideas and getting stuff on the air. And being from presentation, it was a place that a channel controller could say he wanted something. And if you were in the big departments, they were so sort of, quote, powerful in those days, they could say, no, we don't want to do that. That's not for us. You know, we, we're doing this. Whereas in press, you were hungry for anything because mm. you, you've got a very small, as it were, ro roster of programmes, so you wanted more. We started the Hollywood Greats. I said to Barry Norman, let's do a series of programmes about the great Hollywood stars you can get. And so, and so on. And then we did the book programme in the 50s. We did some documentaries. I did one about the Mormon Trail across the States with Bob Robinson. Ian Johnson did uh, Bob in uh, India and uh, on a cruise and some really good, quite entertaining documentaries we made. So you were on the road then as a film director? Right? I did. I did. I, I'm, I made several films, yeah. I was just getting reasonably competent at it when I became too grand to do it, which was, which was a pity, really. I might have got quite good, who knows? But uh, I was improving, put it that way. Yes. What, what are you most proud of? I did a programme called Be Traven, A Mystery Solved with Bob Robinson. It was about a, a, a mysterious writer who wrote... I mean, his best-known book was The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which was turned into an Oscar-winning movie with Humphrey Bogart and so on by John Huston. And I was in New York, as it happened, with filming people for the book programme we and the very it was the very day we'd filmed PG Woodhouse on his house on Long Island and we drove back rather pleased with ourselves having done this to um, have some supper in, in the city and we were in those days after you go out and walk around there were bookshops were open in New York at 10 at night well of course they open here now at 10 o'clock at night but in those days wandering into a bookshop after having a nice dinner and a glass of wine was a wonderful pleasure and um and I remember Bob said, ah, oh, B. Trav, he said, that's a story we should do sometime. I said, no, I don't know who it is. And he said, well, no one knows who he is. He's the great literary mystery. And uh, so I thought, ah, oh, sort of parked the thought. And then about a year or so later, I, I read a piece in Time magazine that the man who everybody thought was probably B. Trav and had died. And um, there was some... So I then started to research it. Anyhow, we, we, we made a documentary. It's not a brilliant film, but it's quite a good story. And one way or another, with the power of the BBC and some legwork by me and a couple of researchers, I got back, I found out who he was, where he come from, found he had a sister and a brother alive who didn't know about him and so on. And, and then I wrote, later wrote a book about it, which actually was, wasn't half a bad book, if I may say so. So of those, I think that's, a, that's the footnote. That, that's the footnote that has me in the, the Oxford Companion to English Literature <laughs> as, a, as a person who discovered who B. Traven was. Very good. But now you had to buy a suit, presumably. You became head of docs, didn't you? What happened was Desmond Wilcox, who was an on-air and executive and a prominent journalist, very Man talented. Alive, yes. And very talented. Mm. Man al I was to a show called Man Alive. And trouble came because uh, Esther Ransom was in his department and was the star in his department and he was having an affair with her and later married her. And a group of producers, senior producers from that department, went to see the managing director, Alice de Milne, to say, this is impossible because, you know, mm. the, the, there's favouritism in the department, the money's going to blah, blah, blah. And, and there was a, a big blow-up, the details of which I, don't, I wasn't party to because I turned up afterwards. 
and Desmond had to leave. In the end, he had to go. He, uh, he so he was going. He went, it. but Esther stayed. Did she? Yes, Esther she? stayed. Well, she was as she was the employee, as it were, and she stayed. And the show was taken over by Current Affairs Department, and so on. That's life. And mm. a very distinguished documentary maker, Richard Corston, who made the first royal family film, was retiring just at the same time. So the powers that be, I think, essentially Brian Wenham and Alistair said, why don't we put the two departments together? And I got the job of running it, I think in large part, because, you know, I got stuff on the air. I was clearly quite a live wire. But uh, but also, although not a great documentary expert, I was also outside. I had I didn't have any foot in either of the parties because the t- two part departments coming together was not easy for them. It wasn't easy for me at the start because A, Roger Mills, who was the sort of, heir apparent for docs had a brilliant talent didn't get the job and resented me having it he became a great friend and in ken house most they didn't know who i was and and um did much like the idea of not one of their own coming down to be in charge that's interesting you talk about ken house so you moved to ken house yeah but ken house had very much a different uh, kind of culture didn't it completely well ken house was the old general features music and arts science programs that that was their home really and so it was largely film a lot of filmmakers there you know and um, some very very good people Um, but that was a new world for me and so I had to a sort of try and bring the two lots together b get some new stuff going and we started 40 minutes which was a uh, instead of Ban Alive Brian Wenham who was a great friend and mentor said um we're going to go in and man alive, do something instead. And uh, can you do documentary series or something? And I, and I, he said, why don't you talk to Roger about it, Roger Mills? So I did, and and then I came back and said, look, can we have a forty-minute slot? Because I see too many fifty-minute documentaries that are over length. Yes. And there are quite a lot of thirties that could take more space. And such was the schedule in those days that he said, I look at it, yeah, and came back and said, yeah, you can, you can we can we can make it work at forty minutes. So, well, it would be impossible today, I think, or very hard, you know, because the, the, the schedule was much more flexible then than it is now. And commissioning was much more casual by the sound of it. Because you, you had fiefdoms, didn't you? You had very yes. strong heads of departments Absolutely. who could commission things on the spot. Well, all the programmes were being made in-house. Some regions, of course, making some. Uh, often tension there. Yeah. Did they get enough? No. Why not? Because the London department was trying to make sure they didn't, yeah. you know, because they wanted them. Um, and the big departments had then, you, you had all the, essentially, I had all these producers, I don't know, 60 producers, and in part your job was to keep them busy, you know, get stuff on the air. Yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was a quite different world. And, you know, you go to offers with the channel controllers, and I'd go, I knew I had, a, I had quite a good briefing from planning as to roughly what he could accept in terms of numbers and num- lengths of programme. And I'd go with about sort of two or three choices in each category. So I could, you know, I, so I'd get all the programme ideas in from my department, spend a long time going through them myself or with the producers, and then cutting those, chucking out a lot then and there, and only offering a certain number to the controller to pick from things I thought we could do well and we ought to do. So um, there was well, you had a great deal of power. And also, um, a lot of programmes were in editorial strands, Horizon mm-hmm. in um, Science, 40 Minutes in Documentaries, the BBC One documentary slot, and so on. And the editor of those strands, really, he or she decided what went into them. And I, with 40 Minutes, I'd, you know, I'd see Roger Mill plenty, but... Essentially, he would come and go through what he was commissioning with me, you know, and I don't think there were probably many one or two cases, are you really going to do that? But essentially, you say it was one of a strand, he had to manage the money, you know. So those, those editors were very powerful figures in music and arts, Alan Yentov, of course, stayed that way, and, yes. and Leslie McGahey, and uh, people like Roger Mills, Tim Slesser, Eddie yes. Mertzoff, in my area. Yeah, it was very collegiate, wasn't it? I like that word. But the BBC was. It was. Well, it was sort of collegiate. I mean, there was a lot of rivalry. Mm-hmm. Well, there is in academe. Of course. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's human. It's called, you call that humanity. Humanity, yes. No, there was a lot of rivalry. Mm. And, you know, the, the big chiefs in my department didn't mind watching the other chiefs 
cover cropper now and then, I can assure you. And, and that was the same everywhere. I mean, we weren't nasty to each other, mostly, I, I recall at all. But essentially, there was a lot of, you were competing for talent, who to work for you, the bright young producers, she's good, why don't you, know, I like her. And you, as head of department, you'd allocate people to the different, you'd say, no, you can't have her, she's got to do three films over here, you know, whatever else it is. So there was quite a lot of competition like that. Yeah. It was a bit, it was collegiate in programs. Well, sort of, shared but, values, all these things really yeah. that point towards a kind of an elitist thing that somehow is inappropriate nowadays or... Well, if, if there were faults, you'd have to look at the recruitment policy. Yes. You know, I think that's where it was. Too many people to like all the other people, you know, yeah. not just white Oxford educated males, but university educated almost entirely in, in any kind of... A, uh, editorial, senior editorial role, or even medium editorial role. Far more men than women, although quite a lot of women coming through. A lot of the bright, pushy producers who were showing talent were women. I, and Desmond Wilcox, I give a lot of credit for that, because I inherited some really good people. Ruth Jackson, Angela Holdsworth, Jenny Barraclough. These were all really potent programme makers, and some, I'm happy to say I brought some other younger ones on. So, But it, it was a more of a likeness in terms yeah. of life. If anything, I think there wasn't enough of people saying... There was a big thing about documentary producers that there should be more authored documentaries. Authored documentaries meant they made films that they wanted to say something to the world about. Yeah. And I'd say, well, I believe in authored documentaries when a producer comes to me and says he'd like to make a film in favour of the death penalty. Then I'll know you really believe in it and not that you just want to use the public airwaves in order to you know, shout what you want to shout. So there was, by its very nature, a sort of left-wing intellectual bias. Probably centre-left. You didn't know how people voted. I mean, no, that's absolutely no, no, no. clear. But liberal values, I mean, I'm sure yeah. there, there were some, yeah. definitely some, some okay. Tories and so on, but that didn't, so what? But, um, or Labour, either. I'd say the liberal values were the, was the world, yeah. But mostly, you know, people were not cynical. They were wholehearted about what they were doing and very much on the side of the participants in the documentaries I was always very impressed by that because you know I get easily bored with people and you know people go make films with people in terrible conditions and all that kind of stuff and then stay friends with them for years afterwards or keep in touch with them to sort of a very proper and decent thing to do and you might say the least they could do I wouldn't go that far but you know that they were they were good people. Now you moved then uh, meteorically upwards what well, this didn't sound like a meteor to me. I was there eight years. Eight years, right. Then I failed to become a channel controller. In one week, the jobs of controller BBC Two, controller BBC One and Channel Four were all in play. Right. And I applied for all of them. I didn't get the BBC jobs. I was probably the runner-up for both of them. Who knows? But there or thereabouts, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was probably the runner-up for Channel 4, which went to Michael Grade. So that was a bad week because, you know, I thought, well, that's it. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I like what I'm doing, but I've done it eight years and probably somebody else ought to do it soon. Yeah. And um, what am I going to do now? But Paul Fox came in as managing director and asked me to go and be, quote, assistant managing director. A uh, hitherto unknown role, but what I did was, a, you know, a lot of the administrative and donkey work and in terms of the stuff that BBC Television had to do. So I learned a heck of a lot. And um, I did that for two years. And in the course of that, I was put onto a group called the Television Resources Committee, Chair John Burt, which had people like Keith Anderson and... Uh, Cliff Taylor. Yeah. Cliff Taylor. And was Cliff on it? I think he was. Keith Anderson, Cliff Taylor, a couple of people from the regions. And our job was to look at what BBC resources would be needed in the future. So John Burt had just come in. He'd come in. He was deputy, he was DG, deputy DG. And yeah. and uh, Mike Checkland asked him to do this. Now tell me, I never quite understand the hierarchy at the top. I mean, you had managing director, but also you had controller. What did we do all day? BBC One. You had controller BBC Two. Mm. You had director of programmes. What was the relationship between them? Who was... Well, it varied a bit. Who was doing what? Well, essentially the channels were the editorial remit of the channel controller. But he or she, and it was he, although I put in a uh, first woman channel controller, their, their idea was to sort of plan the schedule plan with their planners and in discussion with program makers, but to decide what they wanted where roughly, and then to, to get it and oversee it and promote it and make it as good as possible. So they were the editorial selectors, if you like. The managing director was responsible for, when I took over as managing director, I only had two controllers. 
I had all the television resources working to me. Studios, film editors, camera crews, the whole caboodle. That were, and so you had to run all the money for all that and manage all that. And a planning department whose job was to sort of make all this work as well as you could and as efficiently as you could, and also just enable the key program makers to get what they required to do the shows. So that the managing director was the chief executive. The channel controllers were the kind of editors of large parts of the output or whatever you're doing. There was a Jeff Taylor who was, I can't remember what his job was, but essentially he was in charge of the resources, resources total probably, resources yeah. to mm-hmm. do all that working to me. And so that's how that worked out. And then I reported to the director general and the board of governors. And then I had people working under me. There was then a sort of head of drama who had three drama heads, serials, series and singletons and so on. So there was another layer in there editorially. You helped, editorially. Yeah, yeah, in terms of writing yeah. stuff. Yeah. Tell me about the money at that stage, because um, you ran into problems, didn't you? The problem for me was I'm about 15 months after I became manager director of television, we had an overspend, an eye-watering sum of 38 or 40 million. And that had come about because, frankly, the planning was still done on bloody spreadsheets and things, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, and a whole lot of stuff, I think a whole lot of actually further ed stuff and some other stuff had been double counted. And they were in the channel controller's budget and it was in a separate budget. And it had been misspent twice. And it, I didn't know it had happened the first year I was there when I just turned up and then taken over and there was a small overspend and Mike checked and sorted it. But the, the same problem that it caused then, then ran for another year, and by which it was 38 million. And by the time we discovered, we were halfway through the year commissioning and committed for another year with all that up the spout. It was a really bad moment, you know. And um, I had to go and with a big inquiry and, you know, it, it, I, I explained how it, what had happened and to the Board of Governors, I had to go and report. And it was a really bad day when I, I got out of the Board of Governors having had all, all, had all this. And, and the, there was a woman there called Pamela, what was her, Taylor, I think, who was the new Director of Communication, she said, and now we're going to the press conference. And I said, what? Crazy. Oh, there's a press conference, she said, in the, in the boardroom. I went in the boardroom, there were about 30 journalists and photographers ready to have a go at me about the terrible BBC profligacy and overspend. And after that, I, I, I got a bonus of £1,000 that year. And I, I handed it back to Mike, Mike Checkland. Yeah. I said, Mike, I just can't take this. You know, it's just, I just, I couldn't have done anything about the overspend. I know it wasn't my fault, but that's not the point. I'm the man responsible and I wouldn't take the check. And then what came about a fortnight later, I had an yeah. envelope came to the and it was a note from Dukey Hussey saying, we've all had trouble with the money people. We know what it's like, you know, it, it'll go in your account, which is a sort of very nice sort of decent thing to do, really. But hard to say so. But Mike Checkland, who was, um, had been to you, he was a money guy. And, well, yeah. you know, that system, I'm afraid, had gone, started under, you know, yeah. him. But you then go on to the more important thing. Mm. But what everybody forgets is, A, we had a 10% independent quota. And then the governor was going to introduce a 25% independent quota by law. Of programme making, yes. yes. And what that meant was we had to get 25% out of all our costs, not just 25% of producers and 25% of, you know, spend on a programme above the line, as we call it, 25% all our resources, 25% of all our property costs, the whole lot, because independent programmes, you paid the full cost of the show, you know, and that included some cost for their for their their rates and rent and property as as well as all the staff and everything goes with it so somehow the bbc was facing getting rid of 25 getting cutting out 25 percent of all the money and that's what this television resources committee was set up to begin to do how how should we go about doing this we went round to all the regions i'm okay was it manchester or somewhere Birmingham? and they were proudly showing us this bloody great new studio and you thought well nothing we don't make anything here, you know. And they wanted to make stuff. It's perfectly sensible, you know. Yeah. And I remember a phrase that another head of a region said to me, well, you know, we need our full kit of parts. So that would mean a big studio, small studio, a OB, couple of OB vans and so on. Yeah. And you thought, well, I understand why you want it. So the, the process of, and what we came up with, we had we worked with some consultants about this. You know, I'm sure we're pushing us towards sort of a market orientated solution. But in the end, that's what we decide. Why don't we let, in effect, the producers decide what we don't need? And that, that was the origins of producer choice. Because yes. when I went, you know, when I was first 
producer, I'm part of the same with you, you were told which studio you use, you were told which cameraman you were going to use, and it was a man, you were told which editor, you, they were allocated to you. You had no, now if you were a top drama or a top documentary producer, you could play the system mm. and you got sort of what you, or what you did want. But for most people, it was a, it was a, it was a kind of Soviet style allocation. So when people talk about producer choice, that's what it was about. And then, and then how did we decide who would go and who would stay? Well, some people took redundancy, obviously. Some of the better camera people and the better editors, of course, thought, well, I can make more money outside, actually, because there were all these independents are talking to me already and people were thinking of setting up their companies were. And then there were others who, in the end, were not selected for the work because you could choose inside or outside, you know. Yeah. But the, the impetus for this came from the government. Well, it was the government, but yes. wasn't it the right thing to do in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Channel 4 had arisen in 1982, was it? It started. Um, it had um, only used independence. So quite a lot of people left the BBC and ITV to set up companies. Others just came into television that way and started making programmes that way. And they, of course, were endlessly lobbying the government. And I remember going on panels to lobby against them, you know, say, no, 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 protecting the BBC's staff and resources. Yeah. But actually, it was an unstoppable force. Once they were up and going, well, they, why should ITV and BBC not take their programmes? You know, and more of them. Yeah. And, it, and in, in so much as it was, you know, choosing. And of course, it was channel controllers who were a big agency here, because suddenly, instead of having to go to the head of documentaries or the head of science or the head of drama to see what you could get on the air, other people were knocking on your door, offering you stuff, as it were, by the side entrance. And some of them were very talented people. And so, of course, they wanted to take them. And it was essentially, it became a kind of market economy of talent. And of course, people were flowing out from the BBC, setting up independent of companies, course, yeah. who then made things the BBC way. Yeah, or their own way, or, or for other people. Yes, but the net result was that the BBC lost a lot of its coherence. Well, I guess it did. And its sort of culture changed. Well, it, it did change. The world was changing, mm. you know. And um, yeah. frankly, I think it was all for the good in the long run, without a doubt, you know. Who could say you wouldn't want all those independent companies making the stuff, you know, yeah. the talent that they, they brought on and the, the new ideas that came into the system. You could get round, you know, sort of old dinosaurs like me or whoever it was and, yeah. and get in another way. So it was, it was tough for a lot of individuals. I signed oh, more than 800 redundancy notices in a year from resources because, as I say, what a, it was a mad system. I had to run resources as well as the channels. And, and of course, that we then changed all that. Of course, it was John Burt who effectively got the flack from the staff, I suspect. Is that fair? Well, I guess so. Uh, he got the flat. He was very much, oh, he was, became the director general and he was very much upfront about all this and un unapologetic about it. Indeed, I was unapologetic. But, um, and uh, also, you know, he had a sort of brutalist view, John. He, I think John came in before he became director general. He did a lot of work. He went and saw a lot of organizations, this country, like some abroad. He talked to a lot of people in business and government and mm -hmm. other organizations about new ways of running things and better ways of running and so on and so he had an he had that agenda he had a plan if you could get to him before he'd made a decision you had a chance of changing it but once he made a decision that he wasn't going to change it and i think he always felt that if he stopped pushing the bloody bbc uphill for one second by giving in on some point it would all run down back down the hill again and you'd have a job because it was you know you you said you made the the uh, digital uh, yes the interactive interactive yeah. stuff of producer choice. I remember going to dozens of extending choice seminars. Remember, yes. I used to go after work at least once a week, sometimes twice, from kind of five thirty to seven, with a whole lot of staff from all around the country. Some of them in a terrible bloody mood, I can yes, tell you. Otherwise, yes. others not. Yes. In order to try and explain what what was happening and why it had to happen. And if you think about it, I mean, I, I smiled when. Greg became director general and people said, oh, he's going to end producer choice. Mm. I said, I believe that when he starts telling the producers who they're going to have as their film editors. Because, <laughs> of course, nothing happened. They, we yes. made not the name off, but same thing happened. And, of course, it went more and more that way. And now my daughter is a, has a big job in BBC Studios. Oh. And they're a completely separate organisation from yes. the BBC. And I think she was hired because she'd run two independent companies. She'd only ever worked in independent television. You know, she had that commercial mindset about 
how you go about it because it's very hard for people yeah. who've worked in different systems well that was the trouble it was very difficult for people and one understood that and it wasn't nice but quite a lot of the producers who came to complain about various people having to go and how cruel it all was mm. were some of the sharpest at hiring the independent and freelance talent to work on their shows you know yeah but of course when you when you talk to people they always bring up the same old things about the way it was implemented it, i yeah. mean the idea of you know it was cheaper to go and buy a cd than get one from the daft, library the, mad. the was, whole library support system yeah was, but that was that they were they that were that was, daft, was, yeah. it was daft completely yeah. too many business units yeah really silly should have got that sorted at the start um and that was what it did bring into it brought it into into disrespect without a doubt although it did slowly make people realize that there's a cost on everything i do yeah you know i i agree it was a nonsense a lot of it but the essential purpose was no you know you've got the money to make a program you by the way you've got all the money to make the program mm. now how you need to make it yes. which is what the independents are doing sure. you're you know you've got the same power as they have yeah but it it did of course it, it it brought a lot of unhappiness and it was often done in a not very good way i agree and john as i say you know was a, could be very very boot faced about it and he's terrible in, in front of a whole lot of people he's fine in a small group mm. he's very charming and convincing and so on but yeah, he was hopeless at putting it over i think now i think one of the things that one must give him a lot of credit for is his digital vision i mean obviously there was the digits were appearing in television yes. in all kinds of ways but the idea of of um championing online for example i think you were responsible weren't you for launching online well i i i, I was it certainly was my responsibility we did go a work on that but it was it was john again as i say before he took over he went and looked at talked to a whole lot of people around the world about what was happening and what was going on and he spotted this was going to be big and we ought to get in quickly and thank god he did i mean we launched yes. what became bbc4 it was called bbc choice on a budget of about 10 million a year i know nothing really maybe 15 a very good woman called Catherine everett did wonders anyway what it enabled us to do those channels was to occupy the territory because if we come at it two or three years later the government or ofcom whoever it was would be taking the decision would have found it only to say no the bbc you've got enough don't you won't get it but because we launched those digital channels very quickly, really, um, and that was John's vision to see all that. Definitely. That's interesting. Yes. Now I remember making a program for nothing for BBC Choice. There we are. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's very good of me. I know. Yeah. I know. But it was that was that was it. It was occupy the territory, get there before ITV and anybody else, and then, as it were, you've you've you've, you've got a foot in the in the soil. But that was a period when the BBC was effectively trying to, it was expanding quite a lot, wasn't it? I mean, there were a lot yep. of new radio programmes. Yeah. Was your responsibility at all for radio? It was in, uh, when we changed, in 1996, yes, John reorganised, if you remember, into broadcast and production. Yes. It was inevitable, really, and it's, it's led to what is now, you know, the, these things were divining. And the, the, the job of deciding what should go out and how you get it and where you get it from, what you spend on it, is quite different from the job of making stuff, you know, obviously there's, a, there's an overlap, but they are two separate tasks. And even before then, I'd been running it sort of slightly like that in my in managing as managing director. I, I had a programme group and a, as well as, a, as it were, a channels and planning group because only by doing that could I get an oversight of how the money was, because the, the programme departments are always over-optimistic about what they're going to get on the air, but you talk to the channel controls and plans and say, we there's no way they're going to get those, we haven't got that much money, you know. So you could, and this was a way then of dividing the two and making absolutely clear it was divided. And that when that was done, I was responsible for radio output as well as television for three years, three and a half years. And um, in some ways, it was many years the right thing to do, because... Um, so there were quite a few overlaps between radio and television, you know, and comedy and all that and other programmes. But the idea was what we want here, we want expertise in what understanding what's right for the audience, what they need, enjoy and should have put before them. And over here are people who are very good at making stuff. That was the that was the idea of that. But beat by media departments and so it never really worked, did it? I don't think it that ever really I think it was two. There were radio I think had their way of doing things particularly and there was a bit of it in science, I think, and probably in uh, 
one or two other areas, but essentially that the by media idea didn't really happen. That was in production. You know. Do you think radio uh, continued in the way it had always been for a, a period after television had adopted producer choice? Did, it didn't yeah, seem that radio I've, was affected in that way. It, well, it, the, the resources are so much less in radio. You know, mm. essentially, it's a studio and a studio manager yeah. and possibly a skilled sound editor, you know, um, to make a... So they were more integrated. And, by the way, news and current affairs had always stayed... News, but they always stayed as one, I, I think, and understandably in both radio and television. No, I think... But I think you're right. I think it probably didn't really change that much and I'm not sure how much it's changed now save you know there are quite a lot of independent productions in radio as you know that had to be and they came and so money had to be saved there too one way or another yeah now why did you leave <laughs> or is that a, a not a question one should ask no that's fine well when we reorganized in 1996 and John asked me to be chief executive of broadcast it was on the basis it would be a three-year term he then came to me about a year later I think when he was working out when he was going to go, and said, would you do another six months? And would you go up to Christmas um, 1990, no, Christmas 2000? So I said, sure. When Greg was appointed, Margaret, the director of personnel, came to me, and then Greg came to me and said, would you stay on another couple of years? Uh, and I said, no, I won't, you know, because... I've got plans now. I was mm. going to take over at the University of the Arts. Yeah. It wasn't full-time, but it was in one or two other things. And Welsh Opera, I saw. Well, that was later. Yeah. Well, right. that was later. No, and I said, I said, no, I won't do it because um, I have plans and this was agreed that I'd go now. And also, I didn't want to be the last one of the old regime sucking up to the new boss. Because, you know, everybody, in comes the new director and they're all running around. Oh, Greg, yes, there, Greg, Greg, Greg. No, I said to Greg, I tried to stop you getting this job, Greg. You should know that. And I did. And I had. Um, uh, by leaking some, well, not drawing the <laughs> press's attention to one or two things and so on. Because I thought he was quite wrong. I thought he was wrong for the wrong reasons, but he was wrong. Um, uh, so that's, I, I felt I couldn't do it. You know. Right, right. You spent quite a bit of your time when you were um, more connected to programmes and trying to revive drama and things like that. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. What about revive? You know, if, you're child, if you're a managing director, it's no good trying to tell child controllers what to do. You can encourage production of arms kind of stuff. But I did. I, what I did was to make... I, I said to both Jonathan and Alan, look, we used to have a great name for adaptations of classics. It was mm. one of the things we did, and we hadn't really done it for two years. I said, we've really got to get back into this. Um, and I indeed, I organised a seminar. I paid David Lodge, the the writer, mm -hmm. novelist, who adapted stuff for television himself. And I said, David, would you... And I paid him some money to do a... And he, as a, he taught literature at Birmingham University, so he knew the canon. And I said, would you go through, as it were, the canon and advise us on what you think would be good to dramatise and what not, and so on. And he did. He did a very good report on this. And then I, I organised a dinner at which he came and the channel controllers and the head of drama to discuss it. They didn't much like it, of course, because they see what I was trying to tell them what to do. But um, it, it paid off. Was we, the only thing that went wrong was the one thing. One of the things he concluded was that um, the one writer who always failed when you adapted him for the screen was Joseph Conrad. Uh -huh. A fortnight earlier, we just greenlit Nostromo, <laughs> and it was a disaster. <laughs> but we did then get um, Middle March, Pride and Prejudice. A whole lot of other stuff all came on stream in that time. Costume drama, yes. Yeah, well, the, and the classics, not just because of the classics. Yes. yes and the other thing I always try to make people think about was big, big projects. We used to, I got, I got, we used to, I used to have drawn up every, and every three months we'd look at it, a plan for the next three years in the schedule. What would be the big things we can boast about mm -hmm. in those quarters? Documentary drama, whatever, you know. So to get the channel controllers thinking all the time that they've got to be thinking, you know, have we got something for that, you know, some major thing that, I said, would exemplify the BBC. And that became quite a useful tool because you didn't have to tell people what to do. They realised that they needed to do it, you know, everybody. And that was, and I did a lot of big drama, big documentary series we did. Yeah. 
Um, well, I was thinking of the Queen, for example. Yeah. Now, tell us about that, because that was the well, most that was a, watched... That was a one-off. That was the most yes. watched documentary yes. ever, isn't that right? It was, I th so I think. Um, well, what happened there was, I was, as I was assistant managing director, when I was still docked, I can't remember, I was made BBC liaison officer with the Royal Liaison Officer. Do you remember there used to be such a thing? And it sounds ridiculous, but it's quite a useful because it was essentially a very good woman who loved the job, who would filter all the requests for anything that had to be. The idea was we wouldn't do anything about royals or on royal territory or anything like that without it going through her. So you didn't have 10 local radio stations and television all asking for the same, you know, you have to make some sense of it, really. The producers would think it was to stop them doing things. It was just the opposite. It was to try and make it easier in the long... Anyway, I was... Di I I wasn't very diligent at this job, uh, I, but I got to know the people at the palace and I, uh, and I saw it absolutely as an opportunity for us getting a leg in the door and getting some special treatment. If I was head of docs and I took over. And then after a while, um, God, oh God, my bloody names. Um, was it Corston who produced? No, he did the first one. He did the, first he did the black and white one 30 oh, years before. Right. This was... Um, <clears throat> God, such a nice man, I know him very well. Who was the, the um, press what? person at the palace at the time? Ah, right. he then became he then became private secretary to the Queen. Oh, I see. Um, and he rang me up one day and said, "Will, we, we, would you like to come in and have a chat? We've got something." So I went in and with him and Charles Anson, who was then the who then became the press person, and we discussed. Uh, he said, look, I think we could get some special access for a programme about the Queen. So I said, great. Um, we talked about what we might do. And and I said, I'll choose a producer. He said, well, we, we want to have a say on who the producer is. I said, no, you can't do that. You've got to trust me to bring you a producer who's right for the project. Mm. Their one stipulation was they thought a man would be much better than a woman. Um, and so I asked Eddie Mertzoff, who was a top guy, and I, I just thought, he knows how to do this. And so Eddie and I had to go in and see the Queen. So we were invited in, and uh, with... Uh, it was just two of them there, and, and us, and then the Queen into the yellow drawing, whatever it was. And the Queen was sitting about where you are. Mm. I was sitting here, and Eddie was sitting there, and mm. the press guy was sitting there. And we just talked about how we might do it and would it be intrusive and what we wanted to film and general terms really I had to concentrate because behind the Queen there was a splendid can of letter and over a left shoulder was another and on the small table between us were sort of three Fabergé eggs you know and you you wanted to sort of take it all in anyhow we did that and then had to walk out sort of bowing as we went out of the back and obviously that went all right because yeah. she um, and actually she and the Queen and Eddie got on incredibly well mm -hmm. Um, and A, the film, as you know, was a great success. It was the beginning of her Annus Horribilis, if you remember. It came out in January or February, and the rest of the year, the bloody family imploded. So it was a great thing for... And it was a, it was a very nice moment when, later that year, we were covering... We were taking something live from Covent Garden, and uh, it was a royal occasion, and she didn't do that very often. And, we, and there was a reception afterwards, and Eddie and I were invited up. And... When the Queen saw Eddie across the room, suddenly her face lit up and she came over to talk to him, which was very, very nice oh, indeed. That's nice. And you, and they had, because he's quite tough, Eddie, but he was tough with the other people and yeah. utterly charming with the Queen. Yeah. So that's how that came about. And did the Duke have any uh, great well, part in the in the planning? He, he wasn't it? very keen on the whole project. Really. Yes. But we had on it a very good researcher who then became a very good producer in her own right, an author indeed called Katrine Clay, a most sophisticated and beautiful young woman who spoke several languages. I think she's part Swiss. She's, she's a friend of ours. And um, she was very, and she could charm the legs off a donkey, and any man would. And she made a particular point of charming the Duke of Edinburgh. And the moment came for the screening. We did it. We said we'd give you a screening. You can't edit, you know. We, we you, you, but you, we'll we'll take notes of something really terrible. Anyhow, we we had it at the small screen, the small uh, 
cinema at BAFTA, was it the Run Run Shaw, whatever it, during that, there was a little cinema mm, in yeah. BAFTA, BAFTA and we went, so everybody was assembled, and then I went down with the guy who was running BAFTA in the lift to get the Queen and, do, and brought them up in the lift, and then the Queen had a seat in the front row, Eddie next to her, because the commentary was not on it, and he would whisper in her ear the commentary, um, then I was next to Eddie, and then on the behind us, in the row behind, was the Duke of Edinburgh, and after about eight or nine minutes, there was an amusing moment in the field, in the film, and the Duke of Edinburgh laughed. And so the atmosphere suddenly lightened. And I thought, it's going to be all right. You know, yes. the one problem there might have been would have been him. And it was not the case. I mean, I liked it a lot. This is um, before Queen Gate, of course. I mean, there was, a, there was the awkward thing where she stormed out and... Uh, that was misrepresented, but that was after your time, I think, wasn't it? I did. I, I, I rang up and I texted Mark Thompson and said, your blood must have run cold, Mark, yes. when you saw that. Yeah. The following day, he rang and said, would you do the inquiry? <laughs> 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 so I couldn't really say no. Oh, God, so I, I didn't realise you'd done. Oh, right. No. OK, yes. And that was with into Stephen Lambert, who had been a young producer in my department and, and I promoted and then he'd left and run a successful independent company and right. he had to leave his company on the basis of that and soon after that he he took me to lunch and said well what should i do now you know because he had to leave and i said well mm -hmm. do you need to work again and he said no i don't in all honesty mm -hmm. they done he's a bloody good operator he made some great stuff yeah. and and i said well why don't you do this anyway he did start another company and he's made even more money now with a big office in Los Angeles and an office over here. And he spends most of his time sailing his great yacht. <laughs> so good for Stephen. Good for him. Talented yeah. man. Yeah. But of course, the, uh, the royal family, in a sense, rather re regretted, uh, didn't they? Regretted doing that programme in the end? I don't think so. I don't I think so. I thought there'd been a problem with, uh, with showing parts of it or showing anything well, other than the, um, you know, the, the bit with the... Uh, uh, with the outside barbecue and all that sort of thing. That, that was that was the that was Tony uh, um, Dick Corston's. Oh, film. that was the original. The original one. Ah, I see. That was right. yeah. Yes. And and both with, with both films, um, they retain the copyright of the material, so you couldn't reshow it without getting agreement from ah, the right. from the the, the, uh, the, right. the palace, and that remained the case. But the what they no, I think they were perfectly happy with it, but they they didn't want it shown all over the place. Oh, yeah. I see. Yes, limit the access yeah. to it. Um, but, the, the, but when the um, when he was whispering the uh, the uh, the commentary into her ear, I mean, was this a, a a point at which they had editorial say in? No, we just hadn't quite finished the film. Oh, we we had said yeah. you'll see it at a stage where if there's something yeah. absolutely almighty that you object to, yes. we could do something about. It. I mean, that's not an unusual process. Um, we're not saying we're going to, and it's not for your agreement, but that we 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 will note you. This is your chance of seeing it. That was the yeah, thing. but it was obviously a lot. But of, we hadn't dubbed the commentary. A very large amount of trust in the whole thing. Yeah, well, you, you had couldn't to. have done it without that. No, that's why I said I've, you've got to let me choose a producer. I'm not going to have a, Absolutely. you know. I, I guess if I take Neddy and they said, oh, "No way, is the Queen going to work with you?" I'm afraid yeah. I'd have to do something else. But yeah, quite. But you couldn't give them the choice. Yeah, no, that's great. So, in a way, it's your most successful uh, project, I suppose. Well, it, it was quite fun because I was sort of, I, I guess I was executive producer. I didn't get a credit or anything, but I then saw, saw various cuts of it with Eddie, you know, and when it was being edited and so on, because uh, I was close to it. Yeah. Um, and it was quite nice to do that again, having, as it were, been a suit for a while. Yes, quite. <laughs> Well, I think we've probably covered it, haven't we? Well, mm, uh, is there any, any? Is there a large area that we haven't talked about? What it's, was the most enjoyable time? Was it program making, or was it well management? I think make. I mean, when I started off doing it, it was like being in a playpen. You know, I Eddie and Ian Johnson and I used to kind of work saying, if we were doing another job, we'd come and do this in the evenings, wouldn't we? Because we were able. I mean. We made stuff up. You could make a pilot left. We made several pilots. We didn't get on air. And other pilots that we did, but you could. There was always some money to make a pilot for some short show, you know, and that was pretty yeah. good. And it was always fun making. You know, being on the road was when you were. I didn't do a lot of. Well, I did quite a lot of films, mostly short films. That was always 
that's always tense though isn't it yeah. you, when you, you you're not thinking about anything else for the minute you leave the minute you come back yeah. but it's it's, it's it's very satisfying and it was also i think satisfying to see good people come on who were uh, your who were your most successful um on screen appointees on screen mm. um well i <laughs> I did programs with them. They were already established. Ludo Kennedy, yes. Ken Alsop. They were already Bill Hard, there. Bill Hardcastle, who wasn't on screen, but wasn't really an on-screen person. Well, ways. it won. Yes, Good right. face for radio, as it were. <laughs> yes. um, but a lovely guy. Um, and so, so, by and large, I, I where else did I put on? And with, I mostly did documentaries and things. So, mm. you know, one, they were reported... Uh, they were largely poetry, um, Michael, not, 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 Michael, I asked Michael Palin to do the Round the World in 80 Days. I got him to do that because the guy who came up with, there was a very a goodish producer came to see me and I came, I asked him to come and see me. I want to give him a bollocking because his strike rate was getting pretty low. You know, he worked on World About Us. Well, they yeah. probably made one and a half to two a year because they're quite, you had a lot of preparation. And whatever it was, his was... And I was going to say, look, you've got to pull your socks up or, or else. Anyhow, he said, I've got an idea, though, and he around the world in 80 days. And um, I said, that's a bloody good idea. I then nearly fucked it up <laughs> because I said, I'll tell you what, we could do this. Why don't we do it live, you know, with the, the reporter reporting in every night from wherever yeah. he or she is. And thought we'd get my, uh, Noel Edmonds or something to do it who you know could do anything off of he's very yeah. spontaneous yeah. anyhow the, the, it was wasn't a very good idea and the technology wasn't going to allow us to do it at the time you couldn't have done it yeah so then I thought well what about Alan Wicker now it was absolutely wrong for Wicker but what I did know still around was he he was yeah. oh yeah and Alan Alan had a there was a budget I knew in sitting there on BBC One for an Alan Wicker series so I thought, well, if, if he say yes, we can start straight away. You know, the money's in the kit. Anyway, happily, he could see immediately it wasn't right for him. And yeah. indeed, when Cleb and I had lunch with him, we could realise it wasn't right either because he's always dressed up and so on. Yes. And then Cleb Ken said, well, I'll, get, I'll give you some names. So he gave me a list of 20 names who might do it. And I, about halfway down was Michael Paley. And I said, he's the guy. And uh, I said, I'll ring him up. So I rang up Michael, I didn't know well, but I knew a little. Mm. I said, can I come and see you? And he said, uh, yeah, what about? I said, I'm not going to tell you on the telephone. Oh, why not? I said, if I tell you on the telephone, it'll be only too easy to say no. So I went to see him yeah. and A, he'd always been a travel book and I'd seen a film he'd done of great railway journeys in Scotland. Excellent. Mm -hmm. and. What he liked that he just loved it, and I mean, it was a bit of an ask because whoever's going to do it was going to do nothing else for three months, yeah. you know. And anyhow, he said, "I can be free. I can make myself free, and I'd love to do it." So, because uh, he's our runner-up national treasure at the moment, isn't he? He is. He's so a he's a nice after, man too. After, he he's is a very he, nice yes, man. I, I get that impression. That's, apart from just being yeah. delightful, David. Uh, Will, thank you very much for doing this. It's uh, it's been very entertaining, and I hope you've Good. Uh, not found it too taxing. No, not at all. It's brought some memories back. Excellent. That's the general idea. Yes.